this episode of Prog Review, we'll be looking at John Wetton's latest record, which is called Raised in Captivity. Uh, I think this is a, um, a long time coming. It's been a long time uh, between solo records for, for Mr. Wetton, uh, but it's notable that it features um, guest appearances by Steve Morse, Robert Fripp, Steve Hackett, Tony Kaye, Eddie Jobson and Jeff Downs. A veritable feast of progressive rock royalty, if you will. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of John Wetton's solo career, so I, when I purchased this from eMusic, I, um, I wasn't looking forward to doing the review because, you know, John Wetton has a certain style of music when it comes to his solo career very much a adult orientated rock and um, you know it's not really the sort of thing that floats my boat but in the interest of doing this review strand I thought I'd give it a go and uh, see how far I got through the record now I have a lot of um, respect for John Wetton because he was uh, in King Crimson for one of their most creative periods and um, and of course with his work with UK with Bill Bruford, Alan Holdsworth and uh, Eddie Jobson, I, you know that album, the first UK album, something to behold. So you know I can't write him off completely. You know he has my ear, and um, yeah I went through it and unfortunately the record kind of you know it kind of ended up how I expected it to be. But I'll go through it track by track, uh, giving you my thoughts, and you know, and if you if you like John Wetton, you can defend him in the comments section. Tell me why you like it, or agree with me. But um, let's uh, let's get this show started. I've rambled on long enough. Uh, the first track, the opening track of the record, is called "Lost for Words," and I, I think actually it's it's probably the best track of the record. Um, it's got a, a kind of a stop-start structure to it, which is, you know, catches you off guard to begin with. But I kind of liked it because it was uh, different and a bit strange, and it elevates a pretty standard pop rock song from the doldrums. In fact, it's you know, I think it probably is the strongest track on the album, and it's a pretty strange one to open with because you've you've shot your load before you've really got the uh, game underway. Um, it too was along a, a pretty fast pace and it doesn't outstay its welcome and uh, I think the solo on that one is provided by Steve Morse and it's yeah, quite good uh, the only downside is of course the lyrics do drag after a while um, but you know I think you know, fans of Asia and uh, and John Wetton's up tempo stuff will, will really like this one um, the second track on the album is the uh, title track Raised in Captivity and instantly You'll notice the uh, the contribution from uh, his ex King Crimson bandmate Robert Fripp, and his presence is noted from the outset with his familiar atmospheric soundscape guitar, which bookends the song. And it's a shame, really, because we don't really get a, we don't get a proper solo from our man Fripp. Um, the song, once it comes out of soundscape mode, moves into pretty standard rock riff territory. And deals lyrically with the man being born in ca into captivity. It's pretty dramatic stuff. Of course, this is a metaphorical prison, a, a metaphorical restraint, if you will. And he's not talking about being brought up like a, a modern wolf boy or something like that. Um, what's notable about it? I like the bass. The bass was quite good because you see, or you sorry, you hear wet and slapping and sliding his way through the track. So. That was good fun. Um, then it goes a bit weird for the third track. We go into uh, Gallic sounding accordions and acoustic guitar. Are we in Gay Paris? No, no we're not. It's um, it's a track called Goodbye Elsinore. And it's a, quite a departure from the, the pop rock style that we've heard so far. And I guess you could say it's one of those hold your lighters aloft moment uh, moments if it was being played in, in a concert. 
Mind you, in this day and age, you'd probably be expected to hold your mobile phones aloft. Um, yeah, I mean, the only thing I liked about this was the complimentary guitar solo from Steve Hackett of Genesis fame. And uh, again, it's a shame that he only has a very small solo. That's what she said. Um, but no, I mean, he, I could hear Hackett play till the cows come home, so I would have happily heard him, you know, him do a 20 minute solo. That would have pleased me. Um, this is followed by The Last Night of My Life. No, no, that's not how you feel after you've heard this record. Uh, this is a, a song that starts with a staccato guitar riff that you know kind of sounds like it's been lifted from a, an Asia record or even by a long shot a King Crimson record from the Discipline era but I'm just saying that just to make the King Crimson fans sit up and take notice. Unfortunately what Stout's promising uh, soon descends into a bit of an audio fog and, but then we come out the other side again. I liked what they were trying to do, it was you know, an admirable start, but I think it might have been a bit better if um, Wet and strip, stripped away some of the, the big guitar sounds that were used and more space was given for his vocals to, to breathe. Um, you see Wetton's vocal uh, range is of the, of the bottom end and, uh, and once you've got all these guitars backing him up the whole song becomes a kind of a dense soup. So I think if he'd have stripped it back again, you know, it would have um, sounded a bit, a bit better. But you, you'll you'll understand what I mean when if you hear that one. And this is followed by um, the so-called bonus track on the album. Uh, it's called "We Stay Together," and it's a, a real big pump rock epic of a song. Uh, but when it push comes to shove, it's just another rock love song, which leaves me shrugging and going, nyeh. Uh, it's unremarkable, uh, but then I guess that's why it's the bonus track. And the lyrics are taken from the big bumper book of rhymes. Let's spend the night together, spend our life together, etc. They're nice sentiments, but we've heard it all before. In fact, I think, didn't the Rolling Stones do a song like that all those years ago? But Mick Jagger probably meant it, whereas this sounds a bit, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure why they put the bonus track in the middle of the album. I thought they usually put these things at the end, you know, as an off cut, as an extra, but hey, there it is in the middle of the record. Now this is followed by a song called The Human Condition, though I keep wanting to call it The Human Centipede, and it lurches into life and resembles something similar to Emerson, Lake and Palmer might have been doing during the 1990s. I don't know if any of you remember Paper Blood. It kind of jumped to mind when I heard it. It's a big, plodding and brash number with the words human condition being sung as a backing vocal throughout. I didn't really get it. It didn't really work for me. Uh, I think I would have actually preferred a song about the human centipede. Yeah, if you've seen the film, you know what I mean. Uh, Steffi's ring piece, oh sorry, there I go again, I mean Steffi's ring, moves us into pseudo-folk territory with the rambling acoustic guitars and rustic air pervading the atmosphere. Oh, he used the word vermilion, and I'm sure it's meant to rhyme with creed or religion, but it sounds all mangled in the mix, and he might as well have been singing cheese and onion for all it's worth. Go and listen to it, tell me what you think he's singing, it would be interesting to know. Um, but is that a real flute solo in there? Is it? Is it really a f real flute? Or is it Jeff Downs playing with his keyboard? These are the questions that need answers. And a hey nonny nonny to all that. And on to the next track. I was expecting big things from The Devil and the Opera House as the lyrics were a co-write by um, his old King Crimson pin partner, uh, Richard Palmer James. Unfortunately, I found the whole thing rather dull. It was a, a worn out old sock of a song. But it was nice to hear Eddie Jobson appear, scraping his bow across his violin again. That was a pleasure. But I didn't get the song at all, I didn't really understand it. The lyrics were kind of all over the place and it, it didn't seem to know what it wanted to be. There was lots of mixed imagery and it, at the end of it just didn't add up to a whole heap of beans. There you go. 
This is followed by a song called New Star Rising and now as I'm getting further into the record it was beginning to test my patience somewhat and my tolerance threshold had been reached or breached even. Underneath the guitars there's an old fashioned boogie woogie number trying to get out. You can hear it, there's a piano there that sounds a bit like Jules Holland, you know, boogie woogie in a way. Um, but yeah, it features a uh, mic box from URI Heap. Uh, and that's it really. Uh, pretty inconsequential stuff. I've always had a stuff, a bit of a soft spot for URI Heap, especially when John Wetton appeared on their High and Mighty album. One way or another, which he sings on, is a rather good track. And um, you might want to check that one out. It's quite good fun. Now we're getting through the record, and the penultimate song is another power ballad, if that's what you want to call it. It's called Don't Misunderstand Me. It's pretty standard stuff, to be honest. And again, this kind of has Asia DNA running through it. But unfortunately it lacks the polish and shine of that band. And I'll be honest, I just didn't like it, it didn't work for me. It's just not the song. You know, these songs are they're not they're not written for the likes of, of me. Especially when Wet and sings This is straight from the heart. And I just wanted to reach for the sick pack. I mean come on. Who sings that these days? You know, yeah. But then we get to the end. And it's, you know, Everything, even even albums like this, deserve an end. <laughs> the bitter end. I don't know. It's a track called "Mighty Rivers," and it's a, a bit of a musical departure. It's much needed, actually, because it takes us into a completely different territory. And this way, this time around, we we see him wet and embracing like kind of choral music, and there's a bit of symphonic rock in there. And um, Wetton uh, uses the services of uh, soprano Anik van Giersbergen, try saying that after a wine gum, and the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. So you can imagine what that's going to sound like already. I like the intention of it, but as it went, you know, as the song went on, one word entered my mind, a single solitary word. And you know what that word was? Do you want to know? It was the word Eurovision. Now, European visitors watching this will know exactly what I mean when I say Eurovision, but those of you in other parts of the world will need an explanation. And there isn't enough time here to explain what Eurovision is or to, you know, to get to the soul of a Eurovision song. So I recommend that you head over to Wikipedia or type in Eurovision into Google and all will hopefully be revealed. It's not a bad song. It just feels really out of place on this record. But if the UK wants to win the next Eurovision Song Contest, I suggest that John Wetton should enter this track. He'd be in with a strong chance, I, I believe. But yeah, I mean, Mighty Rivers wasn't that bad. It's a you know, it just seemed really strange when you've got all these you know kind of middle of the road rock songs and you've got this kind of big symphonic piece European ah, I just didn't I don't understand how you can mix a record up like that but for me I mean it's pretty hard to be objective about an album like this because the music here fringe you know borders the fringes of rock that I tend to avoid but I like again I, I like John Wetton and I admire him for his work with you know with uh, with King Crimson and his time with Roxy Music and UK and all that. You know, he's kind of prog rock royalty, really. And of course, Mark's always knocked off for Asia. <laughs> but, you know, what can you do? But if you like middle of the road pop rock, then you're going to be well at home here. Again, you know, if you like that kind of thing that John Wetton does, you're going to feel right at home. You're going to, you're going to go away happy. But don't come here expecting past glories or anything in the vein of King Crimson or, or Asia or well you get a little bit of Asia but don't expect any King Crimson or UK or or anything like that and that's the problem with it unfortunately it's just one of those records that fails to engage with my musical sensibilities sorry John sorry. and for that reason and that reason alone 
you know, as, as you know, as they often say in, in breakups, it's not you, it's me, it, it's me. But for that reason, I'm going to give this a middle of the road, two and a half larks, tongues in aspic out of five. That's two and a half larks, tongues in aspic out of five. My name's Darren Rock, and you better prog on.